Hello everyone, this is Michael Williams with the Oklahoma Territorial Museum in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Of all the wonderful stories that we tell at the museum, our most popular is that of the outlaw turned mummy, Elmer McCurdy. While filming an episode of the hit television show, The Six Million Dollar Man, entitled The Carnival of Spies at the New Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California, Chris Haynes, a crew member, grabbed the arm of a mannequin hanging by a noose in the Laugh in the Dark Funhouse. The arm broke off in his hands, revealing a bone. Haynes and another crew member, through close observation of the unclad body, determined it to be that of a human male. Long Beach Police Sergeant Dan Salman and criminologist E. Williams arrived at the scene on December 8, 1976, 12 hours after the discovery of the body. Salman took the severed arm to the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office for verification as human remains. Dr. Joseph Choi, deputy medical examiner, confirmed the arm to be mummified human remains and determined to take custody of the body for identification. C. Robert Gombacher, chief investigator for the LA County Coroner's Office, accepted the body at 2.15 p.m. and designated him John Doe number 255. Dombacher observed that the body was mummified and had previously been autopsied. A second autopsy would be performed by Dr. Choi the following day. Choi found a gunshot wound entering below the right nipple, penetrating the sixth rib, right lung, diaphragm, liver, and intestine. The bullet traveled downward from left to right at a 45 degree angle and from front to back at a 30 degree angle. The bullet was not present, but a gas check, copper bullet seat used to improve accuracy, appearing to be 32 caliber, was recovered from the muscle of the left pelvic region. Tests also revealed high levels of arsenic. The gas check came into use in 1905 and arsenic ceased to be used in the embalming process in the 1930s. These findings helped narrow the time of death. As part of the identification process, the mandible was removed for dental comparisons inside the mouth. Choi found a 1924 penny and several ticket stubs reading Lewis Sonny's Museum of Crime. 524 South Main Street, Los Angeles. The police began a search for Lewis Sonny. Lewis Sonny got his break in show business when he captured a train robber named Roy Gardner. Gardner had recently escaped McNeil Island Federal Correction Center in Puget Sound. Sonny spotted a man, his face and hands bandaged, but fitting the general description of Gardner. Sonny followed the man to the Centralia Hotel in Centralia, Washington and asked him at gunpoint if he was Roy Gardner. The man claimed to be a miner that had suffered burns in a mine explosion. Suddenly the man knocked the gun from Sonny's hand. Sonny wrestled him to the ground and hit him with a billy club. In 1921, with a portion of the $5,000 reward for the capture of Gardner, Sonny made the silent film, I Captured Roy Gardner, and toured it around the country. During the same period, Sonny developed his Wax Museum of Crime, which included statues of Jesse James, Billy the Kid, and Bill Doolin. Any notorious outlaw could be found enshrined in wax. Sonny passed away in 1949 and the operation of the Museum of Crime fell to his son, Dan. Police contacted Dan who informed them that his father had loaned $500 to a man in 1922 with the mummy as collateral. The man never returned with the money. Dan knew the mummy to be Elmer McCurdy, an Oklahoma outlaw from the turn of the 20th century. Elmer J. McCurdy was born in Washington, Maine sometime in January 1880 to a 17-year-old unwed mother, Sadie McCurdy. His father remains unknown, but may have been Charles Davis, a cousin living with the McCurdy family. Sadie's oldest brother, George, and wife, Helen, adopted Elmer and raised him as their own. Sadie took over the care of Elmer when George died of consumption in 1890. Elmer moved west to Kansas in 1903 using the name Frank Curtis. Whether to avoid Irish prejudice or the law is not known. Elmer worked as a plumber in Iola, Kansas under the name Frank Curtis and as a miner in Webb City, Missouri as Elmer McCurdy. In 1907, Elmer enlisted in the Army under his own name. After leaving the Army in 1910, McCurdy ran afoul of the law in St. Joseph, Missouri. St. Joseph Gazette ran a story, Police Think They Nabbed Two Yeggs. A yegg is a burglar or safecracker. Police charged McCurdy and Walter Shapelrock with possession of burglary tools. 
a jury acquitted the pair on January 30th, 1911. While in jail in Missouri, McCurdy met Walter Jarrett, a career criminal. Within a year and a half, both men would meet bloody ends. A month after his acquittal, McCurdy caught up with Jarrett in Oklahoma and formed a gang which included Walter's brother Lee, Albert Connor, and Billy Brown. They intended to rob the Iron Mountain train near Lenape, Oklahoma, six miles south of Coffeyville, Kansas. The robbers netted an estimated $450 of the potential $20,000 in the safe. McCurdy's nitroglycerin charge melted $4,000 into the corner of the safe and blew the remainder into shrapnel. McCurdy did relieve the mail clerk, H.J. Pickney, of his gold watch, which he would have in his possession when killed by the sheriff's posse. A few days after the Iron Mountain robbery, McCurdy engaged in a knife fight with Lee Jarrett as the gang drove to Coffeyville, Kansas. Jarrett sliced McCurdy on his left wrist, his brother Walter across the face, and Billy Brown on the head and neck. Police arrested McCurdy, Walter, and Billy and fined them for disorderly conduct. The scar would help identify McCurdy later. When law enforcement officials found out that Walter had returned to the area, they descended on the Jarrett home. Officers retrieved stolen goods from the general store robbery in Centralia, explosives matching one found at the scene of the Iron Mountain robbery, and under the floor in a mason jar, they found McCurdy's army discharge papers. They arrested Abe Connor and Glenn Jarrett at the scene and Lee Jarrett the next day hiding in the woods. The mythology surrounding McCurdy is that he was a bumbling robber. McCurdy has been credited with the Iron Mountain robbery, a botch bank robbery in Chautauqua, Kansas, a general store burglary in Centralia, Oklahoma, and the Katy robbery at Okeeza. There are several other robberies from January to October 1911 that followed the same modus operandi. All of the robberies happened within 40 miles of Bartonville. It's possible that McCurdy played a role in all of these robberies. Federal and state law enforcement and railroad detectives were convinced that an organized gang was operating in northeastern Oklahoma and southeastern Kansas. McCurdy made his way to Pahuska, Oklahoma and formed a new gang. He met Amos Hayes, who had recently been acquitted of the charge of murdering the man who murdered his brother. Hayes introduced McCurdy to his cousin, Lige Higgins, and the three men robbed the Citizen State Bank of Chautauqua, Kansas on September 21, 1911, splitting $150. On October 4, 1911, McCurdy, Hayes, and probably Dave Sears flagged down the MKNT Katy No. 29 outside Okeeza, Oklahoma, expecting to find a $400,000 Osage Indian royalty payment. The robbers forced the crew to uncouple the passenger cars and steam a mile down the track where they forced the express agent to open the safe. They escaped with $46, the mail clerk's watch, a cravinette, or waterproof coat, and two demijohns bottles of whiskey. They missed a jewelry salesman's sample case and $250 that the man had thrown into a spittoon. In the hours after the robbery, a posse of 50 men with bloodhounds began tracking the robbers. After a gun and whiskey from the robbery were found at Dave Sears' home, he led the posse with Dick Wallace, Bob Fenton, and his brother Stringer to the Rivard Ranch where McCurdy had taken refuge. Three men positioned themselves around the barn where McCurdy slept and waited for daylight. At about 7 a.m., the shooting started. McCurdy took a shot at Bob Fenton, then three at Stringer, before turning his attention to Wallace. The battle went on for an hour, with McCurdy often changing positions inside the hayloft. Stringer took note of the pattern and waited for McCurdy to stop. Stringer took aim with his Luger automatic pistol and fired. No more shots came from the inside of the barn. Fearing that McCurdy may be playing possum, the posse sent a young man from the ranch into the barn to see if he was still alive. He was dead. A pellet from Dick Wallace's shotgun had hit him in the neck and a bullet from Fenton's Luger had passed through his right suspender and into his chest. Much has been made about the angle of the bullet and its track through McCurdy's body. Entering at a 45 degree angle under the right nipple and moving at a 30 degree angle from front to back and lodging in his hip, McCurdy had just finished a three year tour in the United States Army. The prone firing position as described in the 1908 small arms firing regulations for US Army and for organized militia of the United States and McCurdy's elevated position could explain the bullet's path. Amos Hayes and Dave Steers stood trial for the Katy robberies. A jury acquitted Sears of all charges and Hayes received 25 years. 
On a cold winter Saturday in 1976, a group of men, members of the Indian Territory Posse of Oklahoma Westerners, met for coffee in the office of the Guthrie Daily Leader, editor Bill Lehman. According to banker Ralph McCalmont, Lehman brought up the story of the mummy. Author Glenn Shirley, without hesitation, stated that it had to be Elmer McCurdy. Shirley, a lawman and noted Western historian, told the story of McCurdy's death, mummification, and sideshow career to the assembled men. Fred Olds, director of the Oklahoma Territorial Museum, was concerned with what would be done with the body. Lehman stated that being a California, it would most likely be burned. Olds was determined to do something, and with the encouragement of McCalmont and Lehman, Olds picked up the phone and dialed the operator to get the L.A. County Coroner's office phone number. Being very early in the morning on a Saturday, Olds had to leave a message with the only person on duty. Dr. Thomas Noguchi returned Olds' call and decided if they could prove it to be Elmer McCurdy and no other family came forward, the body would not be made a spectacle. Then he would release the body to the Oklahoma State Medical Examiner. With the help of forensic anthropologist Dr. Clyde Snow, who used his newly developed medial superimposition technique where a picture is projected onto the skull to see if they match. To help identify the mummy, McCurdy's Bertillion records, criminal identification system, also showed the scar on the wrist from the knife fight with Lee Jarrett. Everyone ultimately agreed that the mummy was in fact Elmer McCurdy. On April 22, 1977, a horse-drawn black hearse bearing the body of Elmer McCurdy rolled through the streets of Guthrie. A cortege of gun-toting horsemen Buggies and antique cars followed as the hearse made its way to the Boot Hill section of Summit View Cemetery. A crowd gathered around the open grave as Glenn Jordan, the executive director of the Oklahoma Historical Society, and a lay preacher began the graveside service with Psalms 103, 15-16, and Luke 637. Jordan reminded the crowd that the service was a solemn event despite the publicity surrounding it. He recounted what was known of McCurdy and ordered him forgiveness and understanding. The pallbearers lowered him by lariats into the grave, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I invite you all to come to the Oklahoma Territorial Museum in Guthrie, Oklahoma and view Stringer Fenton's Luger pistol that is on display and visit the grave of Elmer McCurdy in Summit View Cemetery. Thanks for listening.